Would you agree that if you're not waking up every morning being defined, you will be predictable in your life? Yes or no? You're assisting a higher state to emerge for the planet at this time in human history and beyond. The goal is that you know heaven is in Earth. If you want answers, if you want guidance, all of it is within you. Your individual creation is contributing to the collective creation. Something within you that wants to come forward and shine. It wants to happen. When you think about the healing of your body, the healing of biology, that healing, when we come right down to the essence of what healing is all about, begins with this harmony. It's about finding the harmony between us and our systems. Again, there are all kinds of reasons of why we lose that harmony. Much of it is our own perception of our experience can cause us to create disharmony. It can be environmental. When we begin to harmonize our heart and our brain and our body to the greater field that surrounds us, this is where your strong immune system comes from and your longevity enzymes. Don't you like talking about longevity enzymes? Because if you're living, if, you're, if you've got longevity enzymes that are at work, it's more than just longevity. It means that you are healed enough to live for those lengthy lifespans. I've been with monks and nuns, we've, we looked at their papers, they're 115, 120, 125 years old, and you'd never know it to look at them. How, let me just, I'm going to ask you a question. Who in this room would like to live to an advanced, advanced age? Who would want, okay, I was five years old, and I was having a conversation with my mom, and I told her I was going to be here for 200 years. I said, I'm on the 200-year plan. Pardon me? 333, okay. <laughs> So who, who would like to live a couple of hundred years on, on the planet? Okay, I see some hands that are not raised. So if your hand wasn't raised, why would you not want to live 200 years? Pardon me? Quality of life. This is what people say this to me all the time. They say, people typically say, I don't want to suffer. Quality of life. Because you and I have been conditioned to link longevity with the breakdown of the human body. But what if the human body isn't breaking down? There are two very, very different ways, two different models of thinking about longevity. You and I are conditioned to think like this, that we, we come into the world and we have our, our tank, our tank of life that we begin with has whatever lifespan we have. Nobody knows how long that is. So we come into the world and our tank has whatever life we have. And we're conditioned to think that every day we use a little bit of that life, a little bit, little bit, little bit until the tank is empty. That is a linear model of aging. And that's what we're conditioned to think. The science is now revealing that while it's possible to live the linear model, there's another model where we come into this world and we have our tank has whatever life we're given but each day, rather than using a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit more, each day we replenish the tank. And when you replenish the tank, when you are healing and fueling your life tank every day, that becomes a cyclic model rather than a linear model of aging. And I've been with people, mostly in indigenous communities, that embrace a cyclic model. So when they live to be 100, 115, 120 years old, I'm not saying they're a spring chicken necessarily, but they are, their eyes are bright, their skin is good, their memory is sharp. I've been in indigenous communities where there is no breast cancer, there's no prostate cancer, there's no Alzheimer's, and these people are 115, 120, 122 is uh, the oldest nun that I've been with. And they simply do not have the, the breakdowns that we see in our society. And what that tells me is it's not about the age. It's not about the age, it's about how we live in the environment that we're in as we attain the age. Does that make sense if I say it that way? So as we choose, and it is a choice, as we choose to embrace the nutrition of life, whether it's what we consume or what we believe or what we think or the environment that we immerse ourselves in, it's reflected in, in that longevity. So I told my mom, I'm on the 200 year, I'm on the 200 year plan. 
But the whole thing with longevity, uh, what scientists now are beginning to understand is our bodies are actually designed, every organ in the human body is now documented with the ability to heal itself, even the organs we were told could not. Brain tissue, heart tissue, spinal cord tissue, pancreatic tissue, all are documented with the ability to stop disease, to reverse the disease, and rejuvenate and regenerate given the right environment. This is the key. Given the right environment. The environment can be nutritional, it can be external environment, but the most important is the internal environment. And what you're learning right here, when you harmonize your heart and your brain, you are feeding, you're nourishing your body with a frequency that your body interprets as love. Literally, you're loving your body by harmonizing your heart and your brain. And it kicks in to motion. It ignites a cascade of chemical events that mirror your love in your body. And I've been with the indigenous people that do this. So I'm, I'm, I'll show you pictures tomorrow, but I wanted to say, this is why this is so important. This is why it's more than just a meditation in a vacuum. It is, it is a process. If you want to call it a meditation, you can. But it's a process that literally harmonizes you with the planet that you live on. The questions about that, does that make sense? Good with that? Yes. How do you harmonize the 0.1 frequency? The question, how do you harmonize the point run frequency? And if I wasn't clear about that, I apologize. The three steps, actually, it's perfect because that's exactly where we're going to go with this. We're going to do them again in just a moment except I'm gonna ask for a volunteer. And you know the front row, the front row usually takes the hit for volunteers. I just, I just want you guys to know, you look terrified. You look absolutely terrified right now. <laughs> but the, the word volunteer means that you volunteer, I'm not choosing, so you don't have to be terrified. No, the three steps. The first one, and these are very, very powerful. How do we do this? How do we actually harmonize the heart and the brain? The three steps, the first one is to shift the awareness from your outer, and you'll have a slide here in just a moment, from your outer world into your inner world. That was step number one. If you close your eyes, is a, a very powerful way. When you close your eyes, you send the first powerful signal to your body, telling your body you are now moving your awareness from the world around you to the world within you. That is a powerful signal, first step. And you are shifting your awareness from your thinking mind to your feeling heart. And this is why I invited you to touch your heart center gently. Did that work for you to do that last night? So if you have studied with the Institute of Heart Math and they are teaching in a corporation, they typically will not talk about touching their heart because in a corporate environment, and especially for women, uh, there's a stigma around having your hand anywhere near your breast in the, in the workplace. It's a funny thing and it's just the way it is in, in a, a traditional workplace, but we're not in a traditional workplace. We don't have to worry about that. So if you can gently touch, just a finger too, just touch your heart center. If you all, just do this right now. If you notice as soon as you do that, your awareness goes to the place of the touch because you feel something on your body. If you touch your knee or you touch something else, your awareness would go there. So this is why you touch your heart center. And the indigenous people have many, many different ways to do this, the Buddhists and uh, in the, the monks and the nuns, it's all about touching the heart. That's that first step. Very important. Second step is to slow your breathing. It is a language unto itself, the language of breath. Through the language of breath, you can send a myriad of chemical signals or vibrational signals to your body to create the chemistry that matches that breath. So if you're breathing quickly, the breath of fire, for example, in yoga, that sends one signal. If you're breathing rapid and shallow, that sends another signal. If you're breathing uh, a, a slower, deeper breath, maybe a yogic breath, where you inhale, and as you inhale, you push gently out with your diaphragm just a little bit so that you can fill your lungs. And then when you release, you draw that diaphragm in gently and expel the air. That is a deep yogic breath. You wouldn't do that if you felt that you were being attacked, if you were in fight or flight or stress. You don't do that. So when you are having those deep, slow breaths, that's a signal to your body that you're safe. And your body begins to respond chemically with safe chemistry rather than stress chemistry. So those two steps lay the foundation. 
The answer to your question, Charles, is the third step that sometimes may be the most challenging for some people, and that is to feel on demand. We are conditioned to feel as a reaction. Would you agree with that? Typically, you, you react to what the world is showing you. We're taking our feelings off of autopilot, and we are choosing to create a feeling to the best of our ability of gratitude, appreciation, care, compassion. Those four possibilities in the laboratory work pretty much for everyone. Now, you know yourself better than anyone else. Maybe you've got another feeling you'd like to use, but let me ask you, I didn't do this last night, what emotion, what feeling is conspicuously absent? What is it? Love. Where's love? I asked the researchers, I said, what about love? And they said, Greg, it's a good question. It's very interesting. Love means something different to every one of us. We've all had different experiences. Some of us hasn't been very good. So if you ask someone to feel love, your love and my love and your love could be completely different experiences. And often it doesn't work. However, now look at this. Gratitude is an expression of love. Appreciation is an expression of love. Compassion, care are all expressions of love. So ultimately, love is the umbrella. Ultimately, we are loving, but we're simply not using the word love. And I find that really interesting. But if you find another experience that works for you, that is where the action is. That emotion in the heart, when we optimize that emotion, that's what begins to send the signal to the brain. The heart and the brain are having a two-way communication. The heart is having a big conversation with the brain. And it is carried pretty much by the vagus nerve. It's a big, big, thick nerve bundle up to the brain. The brain, your brain, I'll be personal, your brain can communicate with your heart. It doesn't do it very often. And it uses a smaller nerve bundle from the back of the skull down through the spinal cord to the heart. So if the brain needs to say something like, hey, slow down, I'm just channeling my brain or something like that. It can do it, but it doesn't happen very often. Now, I just, I'm gonna throw this in, this is so interesting. The researchers were looking at the amount of information from the heart to the brain, and how much the nerve bundles could possibly carry through the neurons. And what they found is that there's way more information going from the heart to the brain than the nerve could possibly carry. And they said, how is the data being transmitted? So I don't want to confuse you, but I'll just share with you, this is what they are finding. They now believe that much of the information is not contained within the nerve bundles, it's in the field. In the field, we are communicating between the heart and the brain. And I think there's a whole body of research that now that is leading to about our relationship to the field that connects all things. So this is the way that answer your question. Long answer to a short question, thank you. So discovery number nine, one of the questions that some of you asked, and I get all the time, how many of you, when I invite you to hold that focus in the heart, do you find that your mind wanders? Anybody ever have that problem? Like, everybody have that problem? It's like people are in their heart and they're saying like, what time is it? Are we almost done? What am I gonna have for dinner? Oh, I just had dinner, but I'm gonna be hungry afterwards. Did I turn off the dome light in the car before I came in, or is my battery gonna be dead? I mean, just weird stuff. Just happens and it happens to everyone and people try to stop it and that's where they run the problems so i want to share with you from the tibetan perspective how the tibetan monks and nuns are able to hold the focus for 12 14 16 hours a day there was a time uh, from the early 90s into the early 2000s where tibet was very accessible to me I was taking groups in one or, once or twice a year. We limited the groups to about 40, 40 people, uh, and that window closed. It now is no longer as accessible politically. There are political issues happening. Uh, visas are hard to get for groups. It's not the same thing. But it, it was during this time that I had the opportunity to go. Uh, we, there were 12 monasteries, two nunneries. It was a 26-day trip, and we were at elevations uh, almost 17,000 feet above sea level. Uh, a magnificent part of the world, beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And it was in places like this where these 
beautiful prayer wheels. You all know about the prayer wheels? It's inside of each of these cylinders is a single prayer printed 108 times on a sheet of linen or paper. And the prayer is also shown on the outside so you know exactly what the prayer is. And as you enter into the sacred spaces, you rotate the prayer wheels. And the belief is that as long as that wheel is in motion, the prayer is being shared with the world. And this is what we do as we go past these 30-foot tall Buddhas of compassion into the chanting hall where we had the opportunity to meet with the monks and the nuns. And in this case, they were very elderly monks that were there. Well, I had gone back and forth a number of times, and the last time that I was there, I was gifted a book. And this is the book right here. Uh, this is what a Tibetan book looks like. They are loose pages sandwiched between the covers held together with a leather thong. Uh, and the title of this book is The Tibetan Yoga and the Secret Doctrines, The Doctrine of the Nirvanic Path. So we could spend a whole month, a whole month workshop, or a really intense day <laughs> exploring this. But there's one portion that I want to share with you because it is from this book that the monks and the nuns learn about how to hold the focus. And I want you to know what they know. So I'm, it's only been translated into English once. This book is, only has one English translation. It was done by a British translator. Uh, and the language is a little flowery, but I'm going to read it to you, and then let's talk about what it means. I, I want you to hear these are the exact words. So this, uh, this book begins. This is what the texts look like. And the first part talks about how to hold the focus. All right? It's called the inhibiting of the thought process. Let me read this to you, and then we'll talk about what it means. So the first part, <clears throat> quote, by prolonging during meditation the period of time in which the effort is made to prevent the arising of thoughts, one comes to an awareness of thoughts so numerous they seem interminable. So what are they saying? They're saying if, if you're trying to meditate, there's a point where you're going to become aware that you've got so many thoughts distracting you, it seems like they're never going to stop. Interminable. All right, so we've all been to that place. Okay, <clears throat> when that happens, it's the recognizing of thoughts that is actually has a name. It's called the first resting place, the first stage of mental quiescence. So what they're saying is you must reach this stage so that you can move on into the deep meditation. If you try to stop this from happening, that's where the problems come in. This is it actually, it, this is the name. It's called the first resting place. When you become aware that those thoughts are coming, 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 dome light, what's for lunch, all these different things, you want that to happen. It's the first resting place. Now, what do you do about it? What do you do with it? Once you acknowledge that it exists, and I love the language, quote, the leaving unshaped whatever concept or idea appears, the procedure is to be indifferent to the thought, allowing it, the thought, to do as it likes, neither falling under its influence nor in tempting, attempting to impede it. So look at what they're saying. When that thought comes to you, let it be, let it be, let it be. There's a song in there, right? When that thought comes to you, don't try to stop it. Don't try to fall under its influence. Don't think about it. Don't try to impede it. Allow it to be as it is. Why would you allow it to be? Here's the reason. Rather, and I love this language, let the mind act as the thought's shepherd and go on meditating, meditating. thereby thoughts will cease to arise and the mind will attain the state of passive tranquility and one-pointedness. What are they saying here? It is the act of trying to stop the thought that gives the thought the reason to exist. And when you stop confronting the thought, when you allow it to be, the ego now has nothing to push against. And the ego will stop creating those thoughts. So by allowing them to be, <clears throat> let the mind act as the thought's shepherd. 
By allowing those thoughts to come without resisting them, they will eventually stop coming, at least uh, one after another after another. And this is something that takes practice. It just takes practice, and you'll see this. Isn't that interesting? So I wanted you to have this because we're going, moving back into our heart, and when you have those thoughts come to you, now you have an idea of, of how to deal with it. Allow them. Don't resist them. Don't try to change them. Don't try to reel. You hear people say this all the time. Reel your mind back or bring your mind back. Don't do any of that. Just allow that thought to be as it is. And when there's no resistance pushing against it, you'll be amazed at how quickly those thoughts will fall away. The three steps that we just went over was number one, to shift the focus. Number two, shift the breath. Number three, shift the feeling. These are refined through the Institute of Heart Math, this is their, their technique, their offering. If you go study with indigenous people, they will do something very similar, but they'll have a lot of ceremony around it. They will go through, for example, shift the focus. They'll go through maybe a lot of drumming and a lot of chanting. They'll use the scent of smudge, of sage. So they will go through, and the monks, this is what I asked the abbot. When I was first studying with the abbot in Tibet, through the translator, because my Tibetan is terrible. I asked them, I said, when we see your prayers on the outside, what's happening inside? So when we see, when we see you chanting for 12, 14, 16 hours a day, and we see the bowls and the bells and the gongs and the chimes and the incense, and you're using the mudras, we see your prayers on the outside, what's happening on the inside? And this is the abbot that told me, you saw his picture last night. He said, you've never seen our prayer. He said, the prayer cannot be seen. What you see on the outside is what we do to create the feeling. The feeling is the prayer. The feeling is the prayer. Every indigenous culture has a technique to achieve the feeling. And everyone learns differently. Maybe those work better for you. In an urban environment, in a sophisticated technological world of the 21st century, what I'm inviting you to do is simply use what you came into this world with, this, this technology right here, without the bowls, the bells, the chimes, the incense, and the gongs. You can use that, but you don't need it. We're still trying to do the same thing. We're trying to get to the feeling, trying to get to that feeling. So that's what step number three is all about. Now, how do you know when you're in that feeling? This is where, this is a lot of fun. The Institute of Heart Math, as technology, as scientists, they ask the same question. And they develop some very sophisticated software behind the scenes with a very simple user interface in the foreground. It looks simple, what's happening behind very complex algorithms to help us do just this. The screens look something like this. When we use an LED sensor that can either be hooked up to the ear, to the finger, or worn as a, a, a chest uh, sensor, Underneath your clothing, you can do 24 hours or longer so that you can record every, every moment uh, and have it analyzed of how your heart is functioning under different circumstances. So you have all of those options. When those sensors are talking to the computer, we're looking at things like this. This is the, the heart rate variability that you're seeing right here. When your heart beats, you're all used to seeing the heartbeat. It's called a QRS complex. The R is the big peak that you see. And the time from one big peak to the next, to the next, to the next varies with every heartbeat. It is called heart rate variability, HRV. Talk a lot about this later today. But I want you to know it's being measured. And that heart rate variability is what you're seeing up here on top. But what I really want you to see is this little graph right here. You see those, those three? Can you all see that from where you are and on your monitors in the back? <clears throat> this graph will tell you about the coherence between the heart and the brain. And it's broken into three levels, low, medium, and high. Low is red, medium is blue, green is high. And there are numbers at the bottom of each graph. Those three numbers will always add up to 100% because you cannot have more than 100%. So it might be maybe the red will be zero and the blue will be 50 and the green will be 50. That's 100%. Or maybe the red will be 50 and the blue will be zero and the green 
will be 50%. Whatever it is, that is going to tell us the quality of the coherence during that time. The optimum coherence is in the green. If you have 100% green, you are in optimum coherence. But what I want to say to you before we do this, it's not a contest, number one. And number two, most of us, most of the day, throughout most of your day, are in 100% red, low coherence. Can you tell me why that would be? Why, if you're driving your car down I-25 or across the 36 diagonal here, if you're driving, why would you typically, if, and we were to measure you while you were driving, why would you be in low coherence? Oh, this is why, because your focus is on the outer world where it should be, and you're not focused in your heart. You don't want to be in la-la land, you know, focusing here. Definitely don't want to close your eyes while you're driving on that 36 diagonal. So uh, I'm saying this to you because tip, there's no, I, I don't, this is not a contest, and I don't want it to be a pass or fail. It's not like that at all. We simply have a tool that helps us to know what feeling creates the coherence. Now, I have to be really honest with you about this. I'm, I'm a low-tech guy in a, a high-tech world, and I'm really not into the gadgets unless they serve us. So we're going to demonstrate a gadget so you can see how it works. If you can use something like this to help you know when you are feeling the right feeling and then let the gadget go. If the gadget is a tool and not a crutch, it's not something uh, that you know you have to run and say oh i'm having a bad day i better get onto my computer and you know hook myself up and see what I'm... it's not like that at all that's not what i'm recommending but i think it can be a very powerful tool all right so what i'd like to do i'm going to stand back here and i'm going to look at you i need a volunteer your hand was the very first hand that went up and I've, i always go with the very first hand it's not always on the front row so let me ask i have questions for you you have to you have to pass the test Jesslyn, can I ask you to come onto these stairs right here? She's brave. My heart rate's gonna go up. <laughs> if I can ask you just to come right up here. Have you done this before? No. I mean, well, I've done the heart brain meditation. I've never been hooked up to the machine. To check okay, it. can I ask you to sit in that chair? <laughs> Have you and I done this before? No. No? Okay. Maybe in so, past life. There's, no, no wires, no gadgets here. All right, so what I'm going to do, uh, if I could ask you to remove an ear, both earrings, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So you have, you have done the heart monitor in the past then, is that right? No, no, I've only done the heart brain meditations from all your Ah, videos, okay. I'm all right, so because you're obsessed. <laughs> well, because it's, just, it's all awesome. Right. It's very in alignment with all my everything. This is the user interface, and there are different interfaces. If this looks really left brain and very technical, we can change that. But we're going to look, look at this in this way. Now, I have a diode. May I touch your ear? Yes. Yes. Say yes. Okay. She gave me permission to touch her ear. Uh, so this was cleaned this morning. Okay. So it is... So what we have here is an LED diode, and I mentioned there's some, you can wear an entire harness all day. You can wear a finger cuff, you can wear a toe cuff. Uh, this is a very Do simple. Need to go through this one too? Yeah, if, if, you, okay. if I could ask you to, to take those off. Do I need to do, take both? Nope, just one side. I can ask that you not move your, you can move your head, but if you don't jerk it one side or the other, because the machine doesn't know what to do with that. And I'm going to introduce you now to the computer. And what is happening, first there is, <laughs> there's going to be a, a calibration uh, where the two are getting to know one another. And this is really good news because she has a heartbeat. You see this right here? <laughs> This means that you are alive and you have a heartbeat. And you laugh. I was in Los Angeles. I had a guy come up from the audience. We could not get a heartbeat out of this guy. It was the weirdest thing. You never know who's going to come to an L.A. program. Uh, I said, thank you for your heart. And we couldn't, I couldn't work with him. We could not get a heartbeat. And he just laughed. He just said, <laughs> so I don't know what that was all about. All right. So good news is that you have a heartbeat. 
And look at this. She started off right now. She's in 100% high coherence. Yeah, but we can fix that. <laughs> no, she's in 100% high coherence. Do you like mathematics? Yes. Do you like math? I do. I'm going to ask you, um, can you begin with 117, count backwards by 23, and do it six times? 117, count backwards by 23, and do it six, six times. One, you're doing really good. 123, count backwards by 17, do it six times. Can you do that? I can mean, you do that? I, I, I suppose <laughs> I could, but... All right, so let me show you what's happening. Every seven seconds, the machine is sampling her heart rate variability. It's running it through an algorithm, and you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of things happening here. First of all, what you're seeing, this is really, without doing this, even this meditation, these are really nice, deep heart rhythms that she has here. So she has really nice heart rate variability. Uh, now you see what's happening here. It's been set, they did two, two seven seconds, it's now been about 14 seconds. I asked her to do something and it took her out of her heart. Can you see that? So her body, to, her body interprets that as mild stress. Not, you know, not a, a bad stress, but I, I asked her to do something mentally. It took her out of her heart. So, and because I'm asking her to do that and we're talking about it, you can see what's happening. She's moved from her heart. She now is in medium and low coherence. We're going to fix that. We can fix all of that. But I want you to see how quickly you can move from high into low coherence. And you're also seeing when we began having that, look what happened to her heart rate variability. It began to change right in here. It's not good, bad, right, or wrong. This is just the way that we work. And it's how quickly we can respond. So you're doing awesome, by the way. You're doing really, really well. So what I'd like to do, I'm going to start this again so, uh, so you can begin with a, a, fresh, a fresh slate. Because our heart field extends beyond our bodies, we're sharing a heart in this room, one heart field. And to some degree, your hearts are being reflected in what's happening here. So we're actually going to help her out in what we're going to do. We're all going to go into a heart-brain coherence exercise and while you are dominant because you are hooked up to the machine, to some degree, all of the hearts in this room would be, would be reflected in your heart because your heart field is part of that and it's picking that up. So you okay if we do this? So now we have the opportunity. We're going to do the, the exercise once again. Now you know what to do if you begin having a lot of extraneous thoughts. Um, I am going to invite you to, to close your eyes because if you watch this, you'll be mesmerized by the technology and you won't be in your heart. So you can see what's happening to begin. And if we could have a little audio support with uh, the, the meditation, uh, if you just bring it up gently. And this is one of those places you won't need any notes. No more notes. Can we bring our lights down a little bit? Is that possible? Pardon me? What hand? Well, you're getting really technical. What, what hand on your heart? Whichever hand it feels really comfortable for you, as long as it's yours. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different workshop. That's a whole different, it's later this afternoon, okay? We'll break into small groups. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so we won't need any pens, papers, papers. You will, yeah. No, you'll, yeah, you'll close your. You're going to go through the whole thing with with all of this. All right. So I'm going to to start this again, so we get a fresh, a fresh reading. All right. If you haven't done so already, I am going to invite you to close your eyes once more and allow your awareness to move from the world around you once again to the world within you. I'm inviting you to shift your awareness from your mind into your heart. And if it helps to touch your heart center gently in a way that's comfortable for you, this would be a good time to do just that. Gently touch your heart and allow your awareness to go to the place where you feel that touch. And this will become more familiar each time we do this more and more familiar with greater ease. Just 
Allow your awareness to go to the place that you're touching. Second step. Second step, I'm going to invite you to slow your breathing just a little bit, a little bit slower than you were breathing when you came into this room, you came to the chair where you're sitting right now. Maybe five to six seconds on the inhale, the same on the release. So I'm going to invite you to breathe with me. Inhale. place in the center of your chest from your heart where you're breathing where you're touching to the best of your ability if you can feel one of those four feelings gratitude gratitude for anything or anyone or appreciation feeling works for you, a positive, life-affirming feeling to the best of your ability. And breathe that feeling into your heart. Allow that feeling to permeate through your entire being, to radiate from your heart center through your body, through the organs and the tissues of your body, radiating outward. And when you reach the boundary of your flesh, the feeling doesn't stop. It continues beyond your body, into this room, into the heart fields of those that we share the sacred space with. Breathe and feel to the best of your ability. about zoning out or letting go. Hold the focus in your heart. This is where you find your mastery. Holding the focus because you choose to hold that focus.
And with one more breath, I'm going to invite you to inhale, breathe in the breath of life into your body. And as you release that breath, gently become present in the room, present with yourself. Begin to open your eyes. So I have to ask, I couldn't ask for a better sample, so I'm, I'm going to share something with you. When I, I talked to the, the, the folks at, at the Institute of Heart Math, and they gave me permission to do this. Typically, this is a professional system. It's used in hospitals. Many hospitals are using this. Uh, it's used in marriage and uh, family counseling and therapy sessions. And I shared with them that I wanted to do this live from a stage. And they said, well, Greg, that's risky because you never know how a volunteer from the audience is going to respond. And they may not respond in a way that demonstrates what you want your audience to see. So they said, you know, Greg, what you could do, go to your hotel room, you do the sample, save it as a file, and then show yours to the audience. And I said, I said you know, we could do that, but that's no fun. I said, uh, I, trust, I trust the process. Oh, so now here's why I'm sharing this. We're going to talk about resilience in a little while. Typically, resilience, we begin losing resilience as we progress in age, all right? When you're young, and we'll, we'll, I've got all the slides to talk to you about this. When you first come into this world is when you typically have the most resilience to the world because you've got to figure the world out really fast. When you're a kid, you've got to figure out which dogs are friendly and which ones aren't, and what, what a hot stovetop means in your mom's kitchen because your mom's stovetop is different than your neighbor's stovetop. I'm just saying things like that. And you've got to figure that out really fast. And so you need a lot of resilience. And as we progress in age, we typically lose resilience. So what HeartMath said was, Greg, if you are going to bring someone up from the audience, we recommend bringing up the youngest member of the audience because they will typically have the greatest resilience. And what I have found is in an untrained audience, that may be true but not in our audiences. So I don't want you to reveal anything you're not comfortable with, but can you share what decade of your life you're in right now? What decade? Fourth. Fourth decade, all right? The reason I'm asking, what you're seeing, those of you that have seen this, you know what's happening here. You have the heart rate variability, and that means the resilience of someone I would expect in their teens or even younger. You've got tremendous heart. Look at these big, deep heart waves. Can you all see these? Big, deep heart waves that you're seeing right here. Now, if you look at this, I don't know how well you can see this in the back. I didn't talk about this before. Can you see the little blue stair steps? Can you all see it on the screens in the back? All right, what that is, that is coherence building. When we begin building the coherence, it hap it's not like a straight shot. It is a stair step. It's a, it's a, a, it's a building process. You build one step and another and another and another. And if you look at what happened, you can see there are two faint lines. Can you see those lines? I don't know if you can see them, let me point. There's one right there, and there's one right there. Those two faint lines create what is called the zone. And the idea is to build coherence within the zone. And what she has done right here, look at this, this beautiful coherence. Once she started building, she never looked back. She never dipped. It was one after another after another, always building, and she is right in that zone, right parallel with that upper line. Can you all see that? Awesome. And she is in, uh, no surprise now, 100% high coherence, but her heart rate, her average heart rate is 71 beats per minute. Now, I don't know you. I don't know what is average for you, but I, I imagine it might be a little high, 71 beats per minute. Yeah, it's usually pretty low. Yeah, usually, and mine is as well. So the reason, what, what was it? My, my heart rate's usually abnormally low. My acupuncturist is like, you're dead. I can't, you have no pulse. You're definitely alive. Right. I'll vouch for your aliveness. <laughs> All right, so here's why I'm sharing this with you. And it, it supports what I said to you just a few moments ago. Often in our lifetimes, you taught through the 70s, 80s, 90s, when it comes to meditation, we were taught that you've got to be in this like, huh, this totally relaxed, totally zoned out space where, you know, everything is just like, and in this, nothing could be further from the truth. She's able 
to have 100% high coherence and awesome heart rate variability, but she is, look at her heart rate. Her, she's an elevated heart rate. And the reason I'm saying this, and I can say this now because I'm in Colorado, I get to, I get to do this in Colorado, is that the US Olympic team that trains in Colorado Springs is using this technology. And they found they can be an extremely high coherence with extremely high heart rates when, while they're training. So these are gymnasts, these are swimmers, um, uh, runners, whatever it is that they're doing, they don't have to be relaxed. When they learn to create the coherence in their bodies, when they place the greater demand on their body, their body is meeting the demand in perfect harmony. The heart rate is now in perfect harmony with the rest of the body. So you don't have to be totally relaxed to do this. Now, I'm, if you're comfortable, I'd like to ask you what, when I ask you uh, to create the emotion, can I ask, were you thinking anything specific? And if you were, could you share that with us? Sure. I was definitely presencing myself. The easiest thing for me is to get into my gratitude. So that's the first place I go. And then I just, and then from there, it envelops into unconditional love and just being really grateful for everybody here. And, and just, I just kept expanding the gratitude further and further and further as, as the time went on. Thank you. So whatever you're doing, it works, obviously works for you. Because you have such, if I didn't know, if I'd never seen you and I was looking at your report on a piece of paper that crossed my desk and I saw this kind of heart rate variability, what I would say is I'm probably looking at a person uh, that is able to embrace change in your life in a healthy way. Do you have a lot of change in your life? And, and is the change difficult for you? Are you, are you able to roll, roll with the change? It is what it is. It is what it is. I, I would say the older people, and I've had people from in the audience, the first hand up uh, sometimes is, um, is uh, someone who is maybe in their eighth or ninth decade of life. And you've heard the term, we become set in our ways. Have you ever heard that? Yes. We become set in our ways. When we become set in our ways, we expect the world to respond to us in a very specific way, and we expect people to be a very specific way. And when people in the world do not fit that expectation, it can be frustrating for someone who has, and has a low heart rate variability. And you will see, it will look like, you won't see these big, long, deep heart waves. It look like a little squiggle, just a little squiggle going, going across here. And when I see that little tiny squiggle, what I know is I'm probably with a person uh, that resists change, where change is difficult. So, uh, so this is the relationship between the process that we're doing, <clears throat> heart-brain coherence, and when we optimize the coherence, now you've got a visual to put with it. You can measure, this is optimum, 0.1 hertz is what's happening here, uh, deep, Heart rate variabilities, this is really deep heart rhythms that are happening here, exceptionally deep that you would typically see in a younger person. So whether you're trained or whatever it is that you're doing, whatever your practice is, uh, I would continue doing that because it is serving you really well. You built beautiful coherence. Um, we did a three minute session, typically each of these is a minute. We went for three minutes, 46 seconds. I started it again after our initial uh, um, session because I wanted you to have a clean session. So I started that when we began again. But typically, uh, HeartMath recommends a minimum of three minutes. In three minutes, what will happen is, through this process, your stress hormones will decrease. Your cortisol levels will drop uh, over 20, about 23, 25%. DHEA levels will increase over 100%. DHEA is the precursor to every hormone in your body, male or female. We all need DHEA. Precursor to testosterone, progesterone, uh, estrogen, whatever it is. You can take pills. People are taking pills trying to do this, and the pills are not absorbed in the body as efficiently as the DHEA that's created from what we've done right now. And you didn't need any gadgets. All you used is what you have. This is a powerful internal technology. This is an inner technology that is typically not acknowledged in the modern world. When I'm with the Tibetans, I want you to know they use very few external anythings. They don't take chemicals, they don't take drugs, 
and you're going to see it when we come right from the break. They have reached states of consciousness that scientists said were not possible. They are reaching vibratory rates in the human brain that scientists said the human brain could not sustain. And they are doing it through their heart. You did such a beautiful job. Would you please give <laughs> gratitude? I couldn't ask.